much for inviting me to speak here. That's really great to have this opportunity. Um, so let me start out with a excuse me a moment. Let me start out with a pretty detailed summary of all the main points of the talk. So first, the broad overview: we give explicit constructions of n equals one supersymmetric ADS four vacua of type two B spin theory along lines proposed by Kotru, Kalash, Linde, and Trivedi in 2003. And we do so in oriental folds of Calabia hypersurfaces in toric varieties. We find that the vacuum energy is exponentially small. Indeed, in some of our examples, the magnitude of the vacuum energy is smaller than the observed value, 10 to the minus 123 uh, in Planck units. But the internal spaces that we find are not huge. I'll argue that the alpha prime expansion is well controlled, but the spaces are not gigantic. They're, let's say, volume of order 1,000 in string units. So there's a huge hierarchy between the ADS scale, cosmological scale, and the kaluza klein scale. These are scale-separated vacua. Another important point that I'd like to advertise at the beginning is that the cost of the search is much, much less than one over the magnitude of the vacuum energy. Naively, small vacuum energy takes an expensive search, and that's not the case here. The mechanism underlying this result is a racetrack of type 2A world sheet instantons, although we'll be considering type 2B compactifications. And what happens is that modest integers, Gopakumar Rafa invariants of flux quanta, end up getting exponentiated to give the vacuum energy. As an example, which will come up later, one finds uh, GV invariants 2 and 252, and a number 58 arising from a particular choice of fluxes in a racetrack, and that gives 10 to the minus. 122. So we'll see these numbers arising in a real example. Okay, but this is basically how it works. Some modest size numbers of order 100, 200 or so get you to an extremely small vacuum energy. Okay, so that's the overall summary. Now, in terms of physics implications, these models are just not realistic. The vacuum energy is negative, uh, supersymmetry is unbroken. And although the Kaluza Klein scale is size, some of the moduli are ultra light. So even if we had gone to the trouble of uplifting, uplifting these models to de Sitter space, which one could in principle do, you could then find a vacuum energy of order the observed value, plus 10 to the minus 123 and Planck to the fourth in de Sitter space. But in such a model, the moduli masses and the gravitino mass would be the present day Hubble scale or smaller. So these are hopelessly unrealistic as, um, as described here. One would have to do something more intricate to make re cosmologically realistic models. Uh, even so, although these models don't help with the real CC problem, which is, of course, getting small cosmological constant after supersymmetry breaking, you could say that they do sort of solve a supersymmetric cosmological constant problem. Namely, they show how an exponentially large supersymmetric universe can arise in a theory in which the fundamental length scale is small. They also change at least our own picture uh, of how accessible solutions with these kinds of scales actually are in the string landscape. OK, and so finally, a more technical summary. What do we actually do concretely? We find quantized fluxes for which the uh, Gukov Waffa witten flux superpotential is small and the string coupling is small. The non perturbative superpotential arises from rigid prime toric divisors with constant Fafians. All tadpoles are canceled, all the moduli are stabilized. And we explicitly include the leading corrections, which are world sheet instanton terms in the Killick potential. To do this work, we relied on a bunch of new computational tools for obtaining GV invariants, for constructing orientifolds, for uplifting the F theory, and for enumerating Euclidean brains, all at large H11, so in the topologically complex realm. So to do this, I had the help of some outstanding collaborators, Mehmet Demirtis, Mankey Kim, Jakob Moritz, and Andres Rios Tascon. Uh, the papers are listed here, and we have a bunch more works in progress with the collaborators shown. And I'll also draw your attention to some very nice papers uh, in the last couple of years by other authors uh, in the same general direction. OK, and just to make sure the overall very big picture isn't lost, the broader goal is to try to compute parts of the string landscape, try to understand through enumeration what might be possible in quantum gravity and try to make ensembles of vacua whose phenomenology can be studied. So in this particular work, we were constructing KKLT vacua, but the general approach is more wide than that. OK, so the plan of the talk. First, I'll explain how we get an exponentially small flux superpotential by a method that we uh, laid out in 2019. I'll then explain how we obtain the non-perturbative superpotential from rigid divisors. We'll put those together to get supersymmetric vacua, and then I'll explain why 
this is a controlled construction. Okay, so first, a very brief overview of the KKLT construction itself, which is familiar perhaps to many of you, but let me state everything anyway. The KKLT proposal for making disorder vacua asks you to consider a compactification of type 2B string theory on an orientifold X of a Calabia threefold. And take this compactification to include the following things quantized three form flex, an n equals one supersymmetric pure super Yang Mills sector on a stack of D7 brains or multiple stacks if there are multiple Kaler moduli, a work deformed conifold region, i.e., a, a Klebanoff Strassler throat region that contains one or more anti D3 brains. Then the claim of KKLT, their main point is that in a suitable parameter regime, these assumed sources can yield a metastable four-dimensional de Sitter vacuum, and the corrections to all the approximations that have been made are, it is claimed, small. Now, we're not going to be treating de Sitter vacuum. We'll be working with anti de Sitter vacuum, so let's modify things a little bit. Uh, if we omit the anti D3 brains, we could include the warp deformed conifold region or not, doesn't matter. Then what we'll end up with is uh, a supersymmetric ADS4 vacuum. The task first is to understand that, and that's all I'll do in this talk. Okay, so in this setup, the closed string moduli are the axiodiloton, complex structure moduli, and Kaler moduli of X. And if we go ahead and choose some quantized three form flexes and form the complex combination F3 minus tau H3, then the four dimensional n equals one supergravity theory is described by the classical Gukov Waffle Witten superpotential integral G wedge omega with omega the three zero form of the Calabia. Now, for generic choices of quantized flexes, the solutions of the F flatness conditions for the axiodiloton and the complex structure moduli are isolated. And so those moduli are fixed with a sizable mass. And below the scale of the complex structure moduli masses, the only fields in the effective theory are the Kaler moduli. Let's suppose for the purpose of illustration that there's just one, although we'll treat the exact case of multiple uh, in the remainder of the talk. And then the flux superpotential can just be evaluated on the vacuum configuration of the complex structure moduli, and it's a number, some complex number W0. Now, if we consider a stack of seven brains that support super Yang Mills, pure super Yang Mills, then the total superpotential is the sum of the Uka Waffle Witten term, which is a constant, and an exponential term from Gagino condensation in the infrared of the super Yang Mills theory. And this supergravity theory with the Kaler potential and superpotential shown does have a supersymmetric ADS4 minimum. You can easily calculate where it lies. And what you see is that the position of the minimum uh, is at large volume, t plus t bar large only if W naught is very small in magnitude. So T plus T bar at the minimum is approximately log of magnitude of W naught, the minus sign. Okay, and now there's a statistical argument that says that although small W naught is not generic, it should occur for some of the exponentially many choices of quantized flux. And so the general idea going back many years was, well, there ought to exist vacua out there that are very well controlled. The trouble, as I'll review, uh, throughout this talk is how do you actually find them? So what one should ask based uh, on this proposal of KKLT is do there really exist consistent compactifications with one, quantized fluxes giving small classical superpotential and suitable Euclidean D3 brain and Gagino condensate contributions to the superpotential for the Kaler moduli? And the answer to these questions, yes, first, we've shown that in 2019, and now, uh, yes, for the second one as well. There was certainly a lot of work, uh, great progress on studying Euclidean D3 brain and Gagino condensate superpotential terms over the last 20 years. What I mean here by particularly by saying that we have now shown that there exists com consistent compactifications with this property is, I mean, with conditions one and two, namely a suitable Kaler moduli superpotential as well as a small W naught. Now, these conditions suffice to construct explicit, well controlled, supersymmetric KKLT vacua. That's what I'll be showing you. Um, and that's enough for today's talk. But let me draw a line there and say another thing you could do is you could try to go toward the sitter. First step might be to try to find conifolds as well alongside small W naught. And we've shown, and uh, the group uh, of Blumenhagen et al. has shown um, that this can be done by analytic continuation effectively of uh, the result in item one. And there's no evident obstruction to combining a conifold 
with non perturbative stabilization of the killer moduli as well. But we haven't done it yet. I'm not claiming that it definitely works, and that's not part of this talk. I just want to make it clear that that's what one would do if you wanted to build sort of canonical KKLT vacuo that are dissider along these lines. Okay, so uh, how do we actually do this? Let's try and establish that the superpotential takes the form of a flex superpotential plus a sum of non perturbative terms. And let's analyze this formula here. So AD um, is a Fafian brief factor that depends on the complex structure moduli and the axial diliton. And the exponential, um, CD, is the dual toxider number of the gauge group, or if we're talking about a Euclidean D3 brain, CD is one. And TD is the complexified volume of some divisor D, an effective divisor. Okay, so this is um, a perfectly valid general form for the superpotential, but we need to show in particular that one, the expectation value of the flux superpotential is small, and two, that we can find at least H11 independent non perturbative terms whose Fafians are not zero. Actually, we're going to require a much stronger condition. We're going to insist that there are at least H11 independent Fafians uh, that aren't just non zero, but that are pure numbers with no moduli dependence. So, to get a small flux superpotential, we'll use a mechanism uh, that I'll review. To find enough non zero Fafians, we'll just look around for rigid prime toric divisors. But for this last stronger condition to find non zero Fafians that are pure numbers, we're going to have to work a little harder. We're going to find a toric uplift to F theory, uh, compute H21 of the uplift of the divisor D, and from that, uh, infer the properties of the intermediate Jacobian, show the intermediate Jacobian is trivial, and hence, by a result of Witten, the Fafians are pure numbers, which I'll just call Fafian numbers. Okay, so that was the, the roadmap for the computation of the superpotential. Um, let's start with the first part, the small flux superpotential. So the general statistical arguments uh, dating back to Deniff and Douglas and uh, Ashok and Douglas suggest that small w naught should occur, but exponentially rarely. And then preferentially, we'll do so when the moduli space dimension is large. So that's frustrating, as of course the computations are harder when the dimension is large. Our computational tools do allow us to explore such moduli spaces to some extent, but a brute force search is still extremely challenging. So it's better uh, to invent and apply a mechanism. The, the best that was done uh, some time ago was to get w naught of order 10 to the minus 2. And uh, since log w naught is the control parameter, that might not be uh, ample to ensure control. So the mechanism we'll use is a racetrack. And let me review how that works. First, a simple model of a racetrack, and then I'll show you how a racetrack arises in string theory. So if you consider a function w of some variable z, for now, let's think of z as real. Um, suppose that the function is a number n1 times e to the minus p1z plus a num another number n2 e to the minus p2z, where the only condition on these numbers is that p1 and p2 are positive. Well, then clearly this function goes to zero as z goes to infinity, um, and it's an easy business to find the minimum value of the function. Now, if the four numbers appearing there are ordinary size numbers, the value of the function of the minimum is some ordinary size thing. But if um, it so happens, so this is the expression for the value of the minimum. If it happens that the exponents are quite close to each other, so p1 minus p2 is small compared to p2. And if it also happens that the prefactors n1 and n2 are hierarchical, then you can easily see by examining this expression that you have a small number, n2 over n1, raised to a large power. And so you get an exponentially small value of the function at the minimum. Okay, so that's all. It's just a basic um, relationship uh, about the minimum of a function of one variable depending on four integer parameters, actually rational parameters. So how do we actually get this in string theory? What we need to show is that in some bona fide solution of string theory, first of all, the flux superpotential itself really takes this kind of form, plus subleading corrections that we can afford to ignore. That's well check. Um, and it has to be a fine-tuned racetrack, namely, there has to be a hierarchy in the prefactors and a near equality of the exponents. If we can do that, we'll have succeeded because then the expectation value of the flux superpotential will be extremely small. Um, and so we'll be ready to construct a KKLT vacuum. So to achieve condition one, we uh, worked out a sufficient condition on the topological data and checked that uh, it 
can be fulfilled. We found examples where it's fulfilled. And for the second, um, we found explicit examples. Now, just a remark before we leave this description, by continuing all of this to the conifold point in moduli space, this precise mechanism yields vacua that have not just small w naught, but also a warped conifold of commensurate size, which is exactly what you would need for an anti-D3 brain to compete with the moduli potential. But um, as I mentioned once before, I won't be going through any of that today. That's not part of the present uh, analysis. Okay, so we found explicit examples. Let's just look at one. Here's an example from a Calabia threefold with five complex structure moduli and 113 Kähler moduli. Uh, we found some quantized fluxes. I just give you some two different vectors uh, in z to the fifth here, characterizing the choice of fluxes, such that there's one direction in the joint moduli space of five complex structure moduli and the axiodiliton, along which all perturbative contributions to the superpotential vanish. Now, you may pause for a minute and say, what do you mean perturbative contributions? Isn't this the classical superpotential? that we're talking about, the gukov afflewitten superpotential. Yes, it's perturbative, but you can express it um, in terms of the data of type 2a on the mirror in terms of perturbative and non-perturbative contributions. And when I say perturbatively flat, I mean that at the level of uh, neglecting all non-perturbative contributions of type 2a on the mirror x tilde, um, the potential is, the superpotential is flat. So what this z equals p tau means is just that there's a, uh, rational relationship between the direction in the complex structure moduli space uh, and the axiodilaton. Okay, so along this direction, it turns out that you can compute the leading instantons. They have Gopuka Marvafa invariants minus two and 252. And so if you just write down the superpotential of the form e to the minus p1z plus e to the minus p2z along this direction, it looks like this. And what I'd like you to notice is the prefactors are hierarchical. We have a two and a 252. And the exponents are quite close to each other. We have 7 29ths and 7 28ths. So that's exactly what we were looking for. And when you minimize this function, you find uh, the string coupling is stabilized at a polynomially small value, 0 0.01. But the superpotential is stabilized at 2 over 252 to the 29th. So that's about 10 to the minus 62. OK, so it's working. But now we're going to have to take this and put this together with Kähler moduli stabilization as well. OK, now it's not going to work to just find one example and hope for the best in all the other requirements that we're going to impose. One has to be able to make lots of vacua with small w naught and then pick from them the ones where the Kähler moduli stabilization goes just right. So we need to be able to manufacture solutions with small w naught. So let's think about that a little more systematically. So you start with some 0307 orientifold of the Calabia threefold. And then compute the prepotential via mirror symmetry. And then find some quantized fluxes that align with the GV invariance of the mirror x tilde so that the type 2a world sheet instanton racetrack along the flat direction um, stabilizes the flux superpotential at a small value. Right? Here, the GV invariance in question, uh, if you know, it's n, I should have explained the notation, n sub q tilde, those mean the GV invariance uh, associated to this particular direction in the mirror. Okay. All right, so we need to find quantized flexes that align with the GV invariance and give a world sheet instanton racetrack within the D3 brain tadpole, right? We can't put in so much flex uh, that there won't be a consistent solution. Now, the first two steps are computationally challenging in some respects, but not super bad. The problem is step three is a search in a lattice of dimension to uh, H21 of x. And that, become, that turns out to be feasible when H21 of x is less than, let's say, about 5 on a laptop, maybe 7 to 10 on a cluster. You could push these numbers a bit um, if you work really hard, maybe even a little bit hard, on implementation. But fundamentally, it's an exponentially hard search. You're trying to solve some Diophantine problems. So you're not going to get particularly far, but above 10, let's say. So faced with that, what can we do? So we're going to try and do this in the setting of Calabia hypersurfaces. So we'll work with mirror pairs of hypersurfaces, x and x tilde, in some toroid for these v and v tilde that we obtain from triangulations of four-dimensional polytopes, delta circ, delta, respectively. Um, 
and as you likely know, Kreutzer and Scarpa have classified all the four-dimensional reflexive polytopes. There are 473 million, 800,776 of them. And we're going to need to study triangulations of those things. Uh, we proved recently that there are at most uh, 10 to the 428 distinct Calabia threefolds resulting from triangulations of the Kreutzer Scarpa polytopes. So we want to explore somewhere in this realm. That's a big realm, which is nice. So if you want to do a computation in Kreutzer Scarpa for this purpose, what do we want to compute? Well, we need to find a suitable triangulation defining a toric variety. We need to compute the intersection numbers of the Calabia threefold hypersurface in it. We need to compute the Kähler cone of the toric variety uh, and actually of X itself to the extent possible. We need to compute the Gopakumar Vafa invariance of curves in X and X tilde, it'll turn out. We need to compute orientifolds of X, uplift them to F theory, and compute. Uh, which divisors support Euclidean M5 brains in the uplift or Euclidean D3 brains in X itself. Okay, so that's a nice long laundry list of things we'd like to be able to know. Uh, and happily, the first three are easily accessible with the uh, code CY tools that we released. And I'm happy to say that we now have the capability as well to rather automatically handle these remaining points. So let me sketch a little bit of this. Um, of these capabilities on the classic plot of Hodge numbers. So here are plots of all the Hodge pairs in the kreutzer scarpa list. And the complexity of analyzing X grows exponentially along the X axis and of its mirror along the Y axis. So everything's easy at the origin, but there's nothing really close to the origin. So we can search for flux vacua in the green band where H21 is quite small, like maybe five or 10 if you really push it. And if you try and compute GV invariance uh, of X using, uh, let's say, the instanton code or, or trying to put it together yourself without um, very much purpose-built code, you'll probably get up to about um, H11 of 5 or perhaps 10 if you're lucky. And so that means the only region we could cover is the overlap of the purple and green bands where there are hardly any dots at all. So to improve this situation, we first figured out how to compute GV invariance up to a few hundred. You can do it very well up to, say, 150 or something like that. And that leads to a sweet spot where we can search for flux vacua and we can compute everything that we need to know. But what I'd like you to notice about this sweet spot is most of the dots in the yellow band are at large-ish H11. H11 is not 5 or 10 or 20. In fact, it's order 100. In the, small, the smallest H11 that we end up being able to deal with is 51. So that's the smallest one that we reported in the paper that I'll talk about today. So we're going to have to do everything at large H11, much larger than 10, typically of order 100, or sometimes even 200, the oriental folding, finding rigid divisors, the uplift to F theory, checking whether the intermediate Jacobian is trivial, computing GV invariance, et cetera. But we figured out how to do that. And so with that capability, uh, we can find small flux superpotentials rather systematically. And that takes care of the stabilization of the complex structure moduli. Now, uh, let's turn to the Kähler moduli. So I propose that we would try to find at least H11 independent rigid prime toric divisors that could contribute uh, to the non-perturbative superpotential for the Kähler moduli. But I also wanted that the uplifts of those divisors to F theory, so D hat is the uplift to F theory, have trivial intermediate Jacobian. Um, and I would like to do this in an oriental fold where all the seven brains lie in SO8 stacks so that the gauge theories are well understood. So the rigidity condition um, is stemming from Witten's seminal paper on non-perturbative superpotentials in string theory. A smooth, rigid divisor contributes to the superpotential. Um, and the condition for triviality of the intermediate Jacobian ensures that the Fafian prefactors are really Fafian numbers. They're pure constants independent of any of the fourfold complex structure moduli, uh, which is to say independent of the threefold complex structure moduli, axiodiliton, and seven brain positions. They're just plain old numbers. Now, to do this, we're going to need to compute the Hodge numbers of divisors. You see the H21 of D hat there on the left. We need to compute the Hodge numbers of divisors in F theory at large H11. So you can't just grind this out by sequence chasing uh, directly. You need to 
find a way to chase through sequences so that you get a closed form expression, a combinatorial expression. So uh, my collaborator, Mankey Kim, did this, found a combinatorial formula, which we published this summer. Um, and with this formula, we were then able to go through and search and find examples where all the Fafians are constants. And so we carried out a search. Okay, and I won't go through the details of exactly where we searched, um, but just say that having found configurations in which the flux superpotential W naught is exponentially small and one has a suitable list of contributing divisors, giving a non-perturbative superpotential for the Keller module, and one is left with an effective theory that looks like this. This is exactly the form originally proposed by KKLT. Um, it's just we're going to have to think a little bit about what this symbol V of T, T bar means. So V is supposed to mean the volume of the Kaladiak refold, and the Ts are the Kaler moduli. But we'll see that there are alpha prime corrections buried in that expression. And that's what's going to occupy us for most of the remainder. OK, but suppose you have this effective theory. How do you try and find vacua? You want to find solutions to the F-flatness conditions for the Kaler moduli. And from this expression, it's easy to convince yourself that the expectation value of the Keller moduli will go like log of one over W naught. Here, the CIs are the dual Coxeter numbers, or one in the case of Euclidean three brains. So suppose you found an effective theory like this. And at the level of equations, you can write down what the expectation values of the Keller moduli are. That's great, but you still need to know where in the Keller cone this point is. So here's a picture of a two-dimensional cross-section of the Keller cone in the threefold with the largest H11, it's 491. I happen to have this picture on hand. That's why I show this one. So what do all these little polygons mean? Uh, each of them is a different phase corresponding to a different triangulation. And what I've drawn here are some starting point, some place that you might be considering inside the extended Keller cone. And then uh, toward the right, uh, the white circle there is the supersymmetric vacuum that we'd like to find. And we would need to somehow find that solution by exploring through this vast space, which has exponentially many chambers. And you're not going to do it by just throwing darts, um, even with a large computer. But luckily, um, one can concoct an algorithm that takes a bearing toward the goal and just walks right there and rather rapidly makes its way to the solution. So we use that. OK, so that takes us to a supersymmetric vacuum. But should we trust it? Right? Is this something that's under good control? So first of all, control of the superpotential. We've ensured that the Fafian numbers are non-zero numbers by standard zero mode counting. And their uh, numerical values have small effects. So you can check if you change the value of the Fafian numbers. Um, the VEVs of the Keller moduli shift by a very small amount when W naught is exponentially small. In fact, we checked explicitly that our vacua persist if the Fafian numbers are drawn between 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the 4. But it would be great to obtain these numbers. Um, you know, it seems that methods uh, recently pursued by Alexandrov, Sen, and Stefanski well, might suffice to actually get the numerical values, uh, and that would be a great way of solidifying. Uh, the vacuum structure that we're proposing here. But unless there's an exponentially small or large value of these Fafian numbers, um, I don't see how these vacua that we've reported can disappear. So that's good. The non-perturbative superpotential for the Keller moduli is in good shape. A further instantons are totally negligible. They're easy to enumerate uh, and control. We also showed that Euclidean D minus one brain contributions are negligible because the string coupling is very weak. So the superpotential is great. How about the Keller potential? This is what gets hard. So the Einstein frame volumes are large. When W naught is really small, the Keller moduli VEVs are proportional to the log of 1 over W naught, and that's big. So everything's big in Einstein frame. But the string frame volumes, well, when you factor in the smallness of the string coupling, that cancels the parametric growth of the Einstein frame volumes of four cycles. Cancels it completely, because the string coupling is small by the same log of 1 over W naught factor. So the smallness of the String coupling is a blessing and a curse. It's a curse here because it makes control of alpha prime corrections problematic. Uh, it's a blessing because um, when the string coupling is weak enough, the leading corrections are all at string tree level, but just to all orders in alpha prime. And the way of thinking about this is that all of the uh, corrections that aren't pure curvature corrections found in the n equals 2 supersymmetric theory come from 
D brains and from fluxes. And those have factors of G string uh, and G string squared in front of them, in front of their contributions to the effective action. And so at small G string, remember G string is of order, let's say 10 to the minus two in our examples. Uh, at small G string, we can afford to neglect those. All we then have to worry about are alpha prime corrections to the killer potential. Luckily, these are n equals two supersymmetric corrections. All the n equals two to n equals one breaking effects are suppressed by the smallness of the string coupling. And so uh, it's not too hard to read them off uh, and to write them in terms of the GV invariance, not of the mirror of X, but of X itself. So here, uh, this complicated expression has first the ordinary classical expression for the volume kappa IJK, TI, TJ, TK. The next term zeta of three chi of X is the famous Becker, Becker, Hock, Louis correction at order alpha prime cube Riemann to the fourth. We incorporate it explicitly, but find that it's negligible. And then all the remainder uh, are instanton contributions, world sheet instanton contributions, um, where Q is some class, M of X is the Mori cone of X, so Q is a class in H lower two of X um, that corresponds to an effective curve. Uh, bold face T is the vector of killer moduli, VEVs. Uh, these are two cycle volumes, not four cycle volumes. And capital B is associated to that half integral B field that's uh, included for cancellation of potential free Whitman anomalies. Okay, so this looks like some, some complicated expression, but at least we know everything that's in it in principle. So what can we make of this? What we really like to understand is do the world sheet instanton corrections to the killer potential give a convergent series? So the expression written at the top, Cn, is the following. So n sub nq is the GV invariant of n times some curve class q. And the e to the minus 2 pi nq dot t is the exponential of the volume of a world sheet instanton wrapping n times q. And so this is the nth contribution to the world sheet instanton series along the direction in eight lower two associated with the vector q. And what we'd like is that for all effective curve classes, this thing converges. So for sufficiently large n, this expression had better become small enough, uh, had better become uh, go to zero, in fact, as n goes to infinity for all effective directions q. So how are we going to check this? Well, we can just compute the GV invariance n sub nq for all the small curves and then just check how it goes. So I'll show you one example. What we do uh, is first find a lot of all the, find all the smallest curves we can. So we found, it turns out, 132,000 uh, curves before um, it became computationally expensive. And of those 132,000, all but 36 are actually trivial. They have zero GV invariant, so they don't contribute to the sum at all. So never mind them. Of the remainder, almost all have the property that uh, if you take some finite multiple of the curve, the GV invariant becomes zero. So maybe the GV invariant of, of Q is non-zero, and of 2Q is non-zero, but of 3Q becomes zero. We call such curves nilpotent because a finite multiple of them gives zero. Nilpotent curves are safely collapsible. They're safely collapsible because when you shrink them down, you're just bringing down a finite number of states. You're not bringing down an infinite tower of states. You get very modest corrections to the effective action, which are expressible in terms of polylogs that are computable. So we do include them. They're safe, though. But that's not what we're really worried about. What we're really worried about is curves for which um, higher and higher integer multiples of some direction q don't lead to vanishing GV invariance, but to exponentially growing GV invariance. So what we did is we kept searching until we found, in the end, 1,728 different curve directions with plausibly infinite series of non-zero GV invariance. These are the most dangerous things. OK, so how about these series of instanton corrections? And after everything has settled down, right here is, is the crux in our analysis, at least as far as we can see. This is the place where the models could well have died. Um, this was the most important correction to the whole vacuum structure. Now, along multiples of such a curve, one finds some GV invariance like this. Here's an example, a particular curve that I chose in a particular model. And what you can see is that these things are growing rapidly. And with a little bit more work, um, this certainly takes purpose-built code, but you can compute the GV invariant at 100C as well. And that's also big. And what you can do is plot these things on some long plot and see that it's an exponential increase with a really stable rate. That's great. That means that for large enough t, the nth 
contribution, Cn, is going to decay exponentially with n. Because the prefactor n sub nq, that's this GV uh, that I'm showing here, that thing is clearly growing exponentially with n. And the second term, e to the minus 2 pi nq dot t, is clearly exponentially decaying with n. So it's just a matter of t. For a small enough t, uh, the growth of the GV invariance will dominate, and the series will not converge. And for large enough t, it will converge. Now, you don't actually have to go out to super high multiples n in order to get track of what the exponential rate is. In fact, in the classic paper on um, the Quintic that was shown by Candelis de Lassa, Green, and Parks, that if you just take the first term GV of C with C, the fundamental curve class in the Quintic, uh, for which the GV invariant is famously 2875, if you use that alone to estimate the exponential rate, you get that the critical T is 1.27. So for T bigger than 1.27, you converge unless you diverge. And it turned out, they also showed there, that the true answer is 1.2. So the moral of that is actually you can get a really good estimate just from low order GV invariance. And we never stopped at the first one. We always went up to, let's say, 10 or so uh, in order to get a better uh, estimate. Can I ask a question? Please, Yuji, yes, of course. Um, so what's the physics behind this exponential growth of GV invariance? Yeah. Um, well, um, there's, there's a sort of glib answer, which is not completely satisfactory, but I feel that I ought to state it, which is that um, if there weren't such exponential growth somewhere, then uh -huh. necessarily we have an infinite radius of convergence. So just the presence of other singularities in the moduli space tells us that at least some curve classes do have to have this exponential growth. Oh, I see. OK, so, so that's um, maybe a little bit reversed. What one would like to be able to say is, well, it needs to be the case that the associated BPS counts uh, need to grow precisely exponentially. To be honest, uh -huh. I don't know how to argue that it has to be a beautifully precise exponential from the language of state counts. Nor uh, right. certainly do I know how to argue it mathematically, only from the point of view of convergence. Ah, so nobody knows how to compute the exponential growth by itself, by some formula or anything. So, so you, you just have to find it numerically at, at this point. There have been scattered works on trying to find the asymptotic growth rates, but to the uh -huh. best of my knowledge, and I could have missed some literature on this, most of those were based on enumerating things in particular directions. Not quite the oh, same computational method, but, but uh, roughly the same. I don't think that there is like a profound theory of these growth rates. It would be very nice, um, but we don't have it in hand, at least. Mm -hmm. Does that thank you very much. answer the question? Yeah. Yes, thank, thank you for asking. Uh, excuse me, may I ask a probably similar Please. question? What, yes. uh, could you say uh, also a few words about the nil potency then? Yes. I mean, right. maybe some intuition about why this nil potency occurs? Yeah, absolutely. So the reason nil potency occurs um, is if you think back to the picture um, of all the different phases, um, uh, all, all the different phases in the extended Kähler cone, there are just tons of curves um, that are in principle floppable. And these nil potent rays really just correspond to contractible P1s. Um, so there's, in, in a fairly high dimension moduli space, there's lots of different places where you can put a P1 and contract it and only bring down a finite tower. Um, so is this if and only if the nilpotent ones are always those that are shrinkable or, or and also uh, the other with, way? With a, with a very mild caveat. So. Um, there are other curves that can that are shrinkable, but that are not flops. Mm -hmm. But the ones that are shrinkable in regular flops are the nilpotent ones. Um, and yeah, so there, there's a little bit of taxonomy of possible contractions, but the overwhelming majority of the con of the contractible curves are P ones with GV invariants um, that terminate typically after just one or two steps. Okay, and so the you. picture, which, which perhaps I should have um, shown, is that the cone is something very roughly like this, where there's an interior cone on in blue, which is where all of the 
potent rays are, and outside it are all of the nilpotent rays. And so you can go through a series of flops by collapsing the various along the various nilpotent directions. That brings down finitely many states. Um, but these ones here, you move infinite distance if you start collapsing them. OK, thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks for asking the questions. Other questions at this point? Uh, we, uh, can I make a comment about Yuji's question? I mean, this is prob probably not not what he's asking for, but uh, you know, Thank you. when Thank you. for for a non-compact Calabi you, you can you can use that to engineer say five-dimensional gauge theory, right? Then then you then uh, people have derived like Cardi-like formula for the BPS spectrum, so that using that you can actually show that there's exponential growth. Uh, ah. But not sure whether that has any that can be uh, applied to general compact Calabi so one thought that we did have, which, uh, which seemed promising, and I apologize if I'm missing the sense of your remark, was that, uh, there's, that there's a connection to, uh, to black hole entropy. There's a, there's a paper by Vafa, in fact, on, um, uh, that essentially proposes that by examining uh, black hole entropy, you can make an estimate for the asymptotic growth of GV invariants. Um, ah. Problem, mm -hmm. practically speaking, is that that's, um, a huge overestimate of the actual growth rate. Uh, it's, it's not false, but it's very far from the actual one. And so um, by the standard, if we had used that as the estimate, then all of these models are definitely uh, not convergent. But uh, in fact, the growth rate is much slower. I see. Uh, can I make a comment? Please. Uh, from uh, one aspect of Okupakuma buffer invariant is coming from the Tionic instant quantization. In that case, uh, I think it's roughly related to Landau levels. Uh, there is some uh, close to loop of the monopole string on which there is a magnetic uh, electric field and the instanton charge is basically, which is a uh, Landau problem. And uh, naturally, as the area increases with the number of the brain's uh, state will increase exponentially. Uh, does that lead to a, a prediction of the rate, actually? That would be interesting well, to yeah, I don't think nobody has worked out, but the uh, idea is roughly that. I see. Yeah, it would be it would be wonderful if there were other ways. Um, and I rather suspect that there should be ways that we didn't, at least ourselves, yet think of, of for trying to characterize this. What we were faced with here, though, was to just really do it um, in in these examples. And it turned out well. I mean, you can see, you know, we can compute GV of 100 C, so no problem. We can just check. So um, so then. All right, for the quintic, it worked to just check at pretty low degree. Um, and the question then that we face is, in our vacua, is t large enough, right? If t is large enough, the e to the minus 2 pi and q dot t will dominate over the growth. Uh, and, and it is. Here's a plot on the left of log of cn versus n. And if there's any doubt that it was really exponential, the linearity of that plot uh, should uh, remove that doubt. So these slopes are all, of course, straight lines. And you note that they all have negative slope. And the right's a histogram of the slopes. We show the histogram so you can see that we didn't just um, miss out on some sort of tail that goes up towards zero slope. Rather, we found tons and tons of things with slope around like minus 10 and really nothing above about minus 5. So we're quite confident that we found all the smallest curves uh, that could affect this situation. This is from 1,728 rays, and the largest correction we found from any of them is about 10 to the minus 5. And that's, of course, under great control. So in summary, um, all of the corrections are at the percent level or much below in this setting, and we think the vacuum structure is robust. So uh, let me try and wrap up uh, with an example and then some comments on computability, and then I'll conclude. So here's one concrete example. Okay. Um, just so you can see all of the details laid out. So this is the same example that I showed before. Uh, I showed you the super potential before. H21 is 5. H11 is 113. Um, here's, uh, at the top, a uh, description of the polytope itself. The vertices are the columns of that matrix. And there are 25 SO8 stacks and 89 Euclidean three brains. All of these are divisors with H21 of d hat equals 0. So the Fafians are all pure numbers. And then if you pick. F fluxes and H fluxes given by these integer vectors, uh, you find D3 brain charge 56. Um, and since the D3 brain tadpole turns out to be 60, you just have to put in four D3 brains somewhere. 
And uh, the leading instantons along the perturbatively flat direction have GV invariants minus two and 252. And the super potential takes the form I showed you before with a minus two e to the 729th and a 252 e to the 728ths. And note the correction. The first correction is uh, e to the 758ths. OK, so that stabilizes the moduli at the g string of 0 0.01 and w naught 10 to the minus 62. And so in the end, we find a supersymmetric ADS4 vacuum for which the Calabia threefold volume uh, in string frame is 945, um, so not that tiny. And the vacuum energy is 10 to the minus 144 and Planck to the fourth times minus 1. And I'll call your attention back to the formula 2 over 252 to the 58 uh, equals 10 to the minus 122 that I mentioned at the beginning. You can see that W squared uh, is 10 to the minus 122. The rest of the smallness comes from other factors like uh, e to the k. OK, and so then there's this plot of slopes on the right-hand side shows you that we have control of the instant time corrections in this example. And a fortiori, we have control of all the other corrections that are suppressed by more powers of G string, which is 10 to the minus 2. And we can certainly afford uh, smaller than 1% corrections to all this stuff. Great. OK, so there's one example. We found some more. Um, let me comment a little bit on computability. So you might have thought, we certainly would have thought, that finding small vacuum energy should cost of order 1 over the vacuum energy. So for example, in an n-dimensional Busov-Bolchinsky flux landscape, you know, there do exist vacua with vacuum energy about 10 to the minus 10, but the search cost should be about 10 to the plus n. You know, if you want to find something that's a 10 to the minus 10 accident, you should try 10 to the 10 times. So we have H21 and H11 in the range of about 5 and about 100. So some examples are like 5, 113, 4, 214, 7, 51. And so the flex landscape is low dimensional. The dimension's like 5. So how in the world uh, did we even succeed in finding anything with small vacuum energy, let alone doing so quickly? Uh, let me stress, uh, by the way, that the largeness of H11 is not essential here. It's an accident of kreutzer skarka If you think back to the Hodge numbers plot that I showed you, there just don't happen to be any uh, tractable examples with H11 small. If we get better at making hard things tractable, maybe we can find examples with small H11 as well. So why can we succeed at all in finding small uh, vacuum energy? Well, we're not doing buso polchinski In a buso polchinski landscape of dimension n, one has a vacuum energy formula that looks roughly like minus a big number plus some quadratic form C uh, dotting together two vectors of integers, well, two copies of the same vector of integers, Q in Z to the N. Sorry, that should say Q is in Z to the N, not C is in Z to the N. Um, and what do you do? You try and fine tune a vast number of order one terms to some precision of order 10 to the minus N. And if you're very industrious, you might be able to do that. It's in principle possible. In our construction, uh, we have a superpotential that has a perturbative term and some non-perturbative terms. And we just get rid of the perturbative term exactly by an explicit choice of flux quanta. And all that's left are things that are non-perturbative. But then all one has to do is take those non-perturbative things and play them off against each other. The result will necessarily be non-perturbatively small. But the effort of playing them off against each other is only polynomial. One just has to find suitable integers and work polynomially hard. Um, to make them balance in a nice race track. Now, I should say some computational advances were required in order to actually enumerate the integers to be used in the tuning. So the effective theory that I wrote down here, um, you could have made it up as an EFT. Probably at some level, people did make it up as an EFT in, let's say, 1985 or something like that, um, as, as in the old uh, studies of racetracks. But the question is, do the relevant integers actually arise in a quantum gravity construction. So that's where one had to do a little more work. So the computational advances we needed, well, we had to be able to construct their antifolds, their uplifts, compute intersection numbers, GV invariants, et cetera, et cetera, enumerate the curves that can be flopped and that can't be flopped, find quantized fluxes giving small w naught, and have to do all this at large H11 and automatically on a large scale. And although we've been working on computational efforts in this direction for a while, two years ago, the only one of these things we could do at large H11 is compute intersection numbers. All the rest was uh, inaccessible. But we made some progress, and now we can do all these things at large H11 automatically on a large scale. And that's how we were able to find these vacua uh, with CY tools. So with that capability in hand and with those data, we can then work polynomially hard in picking integers and find exponentially small CCs. 
And the final answers are expressed in terms of those integers, fundamentally quantized parameters, and a lot can be verified by hand. Okay, so now let me conclude. Um, we've given explicit constructions of supersymmetric ADS4 vacua in Claudio threefold orientifolds with H21 up to seven and H11 at least 51. The stabilization is a weak string coupling, large complex structure, large Einstein frame volume. And we've tested these things uh, rather intensively and we judge them to be robust. These are incarnations of the KKLT scenario. And so uh, we have found that supersymmetric KKLT vacua are in the landscape. The mechanism that we used for small w naught led to exponentially small magnitude of the vacuum energy. Um, and because the search is automated, large scale studies are possible. But what we've left for the future is the question of an uplift to De Sitter space. Thanks very much for your attention.